Time period eight runs from the end of World War II in 1945 until the so-called Reagan Revolution of 1980. This time period is called post-war America because it's the time after World War II, and it's defined by a flourishing economy and a dominant role for America in global politics. Overall, this time period counts for 15% of the total curriculum, and it's fair game for the DBQ question. One challenge that a lot of AP teachers face is to fit this material in before the real AP exam in May. There's just so much material to cover in one year, so students end up having to study this material on their own because maybe by the time of the AP exam, they're still in the 1940s. As you study for this exam, keep three key concepts in mind. Key concept 8.1 says, the United States responded to an uncertain and unstable post-war world by asserting and working to maintain a position of global leadership with far-reaching domestic and international consequences. So this key concept is about the Cold War. And when we talk about a war being cold, what we mean is that there are no hot battles. There are no direct conflicts between the two countries. So the Cold War is between the United States and the Soviet Union, who never actually fought each other directly. The fight was played out in other countries and in other parts of the world. So what this key concept is pointing out is that this time period is defined by a back and forth between tense periods of diplomatic crisis and these more relaxed periods of tolerance, what we call detente. In the years immediately after World War II, the United States put a lot of money into Western Europe to prevent those countries from becoming communist and to really help them rebuild after the war. This was called the Marshall Plan, and it's a great example of how the United States uses soft power to indirectly stop communism. It's a good example of a Cold War tactic. Also, as big empires around the world began totally breaking down, the United States and the Soviet Union got involved with these new countries, especially in Africa and Asia. But there were some intense battles in the Cold War you could look at the Korean War in the early 1950s, where the Soviet Union and China begin to support the north part of Korea, and the Americans begin to support the south part of Korea. You could look at the Vietnam War of the 1960s, where the same game is being played. The Soviet Union and the United States are fighting a war with each other in another country. As the Cold War developed, people inside the United States began to debate all sorts of things about the role of the federal government and individual freedom. For example, Americans started debating about the policies and methods that were used to interrogate and find communists. So think of Joseph McCarthy's crusade in the 1950s to root out communists in the State Department. One of the important debates that emerged was how much power a president should have as commander in chief to just start a war somewhere. According to the Constitution, it's Congress that has the right to start the war. So in the 1970s, we see Congress pass the War Powers Resolution that begins to specifically define the role of the Commander-in-Chief in getting involved abroad. The Vietnam War raised all sorts of protests inside the United States, on college campuses, and the streets of large cities. They began asking questions. Why are we building a large nuclear arsenal? Why are we building a large military-industrial complex? And why are we getting involved in wars on the other side of the world? This is what Key Concept 8.1 is all about. It's about uncertainty in the post-war era. The United States was rising to this position of great international importance, but all sorts of questions emerged with what to do with our nuclear arsenal and whether we should get involved in stopping communism by starting a war. 